the modern day civil rights movement. I can't be completely just toned deaf to things that are going on in society and things that are happening around us. Those hard conversations talking about equality, that's what's gonna make us wanna unify. People of every color working towards change in a divided society. We did away with any kind of neck holds, neck restraints. America is standing at a critical crossroads. We wanna explore the roots of racism, discrimination in this country. It's our connections to know where we come from, what did we do, what were our accomplishments and achievements. The investment in a new world of opportunities. We're going to see a black business boom. I have built a lot of bridges that can take me far. This is Project Community, equality and change. I know even if I'm gone, the seeds I planted will still live on. Here are Mark Kelly, Aaron Guy, and Caroline Coles. In just three days, the former Minneapolis police officer convicted of killing George Floyd will be sentenced. The video showing Derek Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes prompted extreme outrage. It also led to protests against police brutality and racial injustice. From that civil unrest came the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which includes stopping racial profiling, banning chokeholds and no knock warrants, the creation of a national police misconduct registry and overhauling the qualified immunity for officers. And right now that immunity protects officers accused of violating the Constitution while on duty. Abolishing it is one of the controversies. In state capitals across this country, the bill took center stage after the death of George Floyd. In Florida, Representative Michelle Rayner led the charge to scrap the police protection. That lets them know that they will be held liable if they do something wrong. For example, instead of just suing the Minnesota Police Department, we people would be able to sue Derek Chauvin in his individual capacity, not only as an officer, but also as a uh, as an individual. A lot of public uh, employees have qualified immunity. And just to target police, I feel I feel it's very, very unfair. President of both the Palm Beach County and the statewide Police Benevolent Association, John Kazanjian represents law enforcement from the Keys to the Panhandle. 99.9% .9 of us go out there with no intent to hurt anybody, all right? We just want to enforce the law, period. That is it. And if we can't do that and have the protections for the qualified immunity, you're not going to find anybody to do this job. Kazanjian warns that without it, civil cases will jam the courts and lead many longtime officers into early retirement. If they want some police reform, I'm all for it. If they want to do some tracking of some police officers, you know, get rid of some bad apples, I'm okay with that. But you need to leave qualified immunity alone, period. Kazanjian got his wish. Rayner's bill was never given a committee hearing. So in Florida, qualified immunity still stands. George Floyd's death not only ignited fury around the world, but triggered changes right here where we live. Just last June, the aftermath of the killing exploded into our streets with riots and protests. And that outcry was heard right here in Palm Beach County. They say it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to rebuild and change a community. And leading that mission in Pearl City, a historically black community in Boca Raton, is Reverend Ron Brown, the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. We have had marches. We have constant dialogue with the mayor and, and the police chief and, and everyone else to make sure that we have everything in line. Making sure things are in line has been a top priority for many leaders throughout South County, including Delray Beach Police Chief Gerald Sims. The choking was a big issue, so we made sure we put in our policy that choking isn't allowed unless there's a life and death circumstance. Other police departments in South County are also re-examining their policies. The deputy chief of Boynton Beach Police, Vanessa Snow, says her department has updated its policies to allow fellow officers to intervene when they see something against the department's policy. The duty to intervene was important to add because it highlights the importance of giving the officers the tools that they need should something happen that they do not agree with. In addition to policy changes, people from different racial backgrounds are standing together. Delray Beach activists Chris Caesar and Steve Mushelitz host community discussions called Cars and Conversations, where they give away cars to mothers in need and talk about race. The two men started hosting this event back in 2019. Those hard conversations talking about 
equality, that's what's going to make us want to unify. My goal was just to bring everybody together, be able to have a comfortable place where you can come and talk to each other. And to make sure these discussions don't fall on deaf ears, Steve and Chris make sure the entire community is a part of these talks. From police chiefs to local politicians to the youth, no matter the race, change begins at home. And in the city of West Palm Beach, the conversations continue. The mayor's task force for racial and ethnic equality came together with a mission to identify what problems they still need to tackle. No justice! The fight against racial injustice continues in West Palm Beach. Attorney Michelle Differenderfer and CEO of the Urban League of Palm Beach County, Patrick Franklin, serve as the co-chairs on the mayor's task force. We're learning about what are the current practices of the city in training police officers? What are the current salaries of the city for police officers? Where do those fit? So far, the group has held two summits, one in December and one this month, which has allowed people to voice their concerns about racial inequities. We've engaged in conversations. We've engaged in the ability to communicate with, with each other to look at prevention and to look at other means to stop us from escalating to an out of control environment. The task force is split into five different subcommittees, criminal justice, education, business, real estate and health. Their mission is to come up with policy changes that will advance racial equity. Not everything is going to be a, a short term uh, change. It's, it's going to be long term. It's going to be midterm, long term issues that we have to deal with. And it's going to go beyond this committee but hopefully we will we, we'll, we'll leave a framework. No policy changes have been made yet, but the task force is already using their platform to improve vaccine distribution for communities of color. We know that um, at least one of the groups is working on doing this through uh, churches, local churches, because one of the issues they have is you need an ID. Well, not everyone has an ID. So if you don't have an ID, how do you get a vaccine? So they're working on a process through the people's churches. Like if your pastor knows who you are and can put a letter in. A group creating change one idea at a time. This month's summit turned out to be a major success. More than 200 people participated. Also, in addition to the issues they've already identified in the past, the task force will also now focus on addressing mental health right here in our community. They're meeting again on June 24th. My dad made it to like fourth grade. My mom made it to high school. Making sure minority students graduate. The people behind the push for graduation day. Plus, encouraging change by exploring other people's views on race. And the rich history of a now abandoned school and the hope for its future. Palm Beach State College is doing its part to make sure its minority students have everything they need to graduate. Just over a year ago, the college opened up the Cross Cultural Equity Institute to empower people from underprivileged communities to complete their education. Shane Wright has more on the barriers students are still facing. For some families, graduating college is a rite of passage. A transition into the real world. However, while graduation is real for some, it's a real problem for others. School wasn't really their thing, it wasn't my thing. My dad made it to like fourth grade. My mom made it to high school. Rafael Gutierrez's parents are from the Dominican Republic. College took somewhat of a back seat as the family worked to just survive. We didn't start, you know, at the same line as everyone else. Now a graduate from Palm Beach State College, his story started like so many other minorities who struggled to complete college. In 2020, the graduation rate for black students was 38.6%, 41% for Hispanic students, and 43.9% for white students. However, when it comes to black males specifically, the graduation rate plummeted to 29.3%. 
personal reasons. Most of the time it was financial. Those disparities were given a lifeline in 2019. Later this year, we'll be breaking ground and adding this as a space. When local philanthropist Dr. Barbara Carey Schuler made a donation to the school to help create the Cross-Cultural Equity Institute. Dr. Carlene Prophet. At each of these panels, what we're looking to is to think about some prominent men of color that have been successful. Is the interim director. The student that may say, well, financially I can't afford to come to school full time. We can help them see, hey, you can work part time, but if you commit to coming to school full time, we'll provide you that wraparound support service you would need. Some of those services include personal counseling, academic advising, peer mentoring, almost anything needed to close the educational gap minorities face. If they come across a roadblock, we don't want you to just drop out of school because you have any kind of issue. Come to us first, let's see how we can figure it out. And it's just been a phenomenal experience and I think it's the difference between me throwing in the towel and being like, okay, another semester in the books. And in just a year, the graduation rate among black males already up 1.4%. It is really meant for everyone but with the focus on the tools needed to help men of color who are struggling so much uh, with college. I don't think I would have been able to graduate without them. For Project Community, Equality and Change. Go Panthers, your future alone. I'm Shane Wright. The resources are free to students. The college hopes to finish construction on the new Cross-Cultural Equity Institute building soon. Black student unions are organizations dedicated to encouraging cultural diversity within schools. Local teachers and students involved in creating change say recent events have shaped the way they think and what they believe needs to happen next. It is a place to teach students advocacy um, and to educate them about um, not just social issues, but you know, how to navigate the world. From marches to protests to unsettling scenes across the world. How do you navigate telling your truth and, and being able to move forward without being offensive? That's just one of the many difficult discussions Kimberly Smith had to have with students at the Black Student Union at Palm Beach Gardens High School. After watching so many of these stories play out, their union made changes and has grown. Smith helped create an equity committee that includes both students and teachers. That's where things got a little tricky um, because... You know, students are developing their views and they're willing to explore while adults already have their views um, kind of set. This sparked great conversations. Tamara Stewart, the former vice president of the student union and graduate of Gardens High School, was a part of all of it. I think the country is progressing, not fast enough, but we're seeing change. And um, I think it starts with the youth, especially um, in school. So if we teach it in school system, we can't be completely just tone deaf to things that are going on um, in society and things that are happening around us. But not all discussions were about relationships with law enforcement and marches. So much happened in the last year, so I want to say it was like whiplash. The pandemic triggered other feelings to surface at John I. Leonard High School. A big one, economic disparities. The differences between the quality of one person's computer versus the other person's computer not being able to access the internet. It was a life lesson that prompted a course on how to advocate for yourself, and they did, taking a detailed presentation straight to administrators. Our administration obliged. They sat down, and um, it was summertime, it was like July, and they sat down um, on a Google Meet and they listened to the students and, and validated their feelings and, and um, allowed them to you know, express how they were feeling. The meeting, along with others, led to a district-wide Black Student Union community and the creation of a professional learning community called Racial Equity and Cultural Competence. The mission is to do research and explore diversity training. The core belief of these unions stands firm, focus on education and the young minds of our future. I definitely find hope um, and joy and anxiety. <laughs> so, but I find a little bit of everything. I am inspired by their passion and by their tenacity and by the fact that they're always ready to come back to ground zero. Both unions have grown over the past year. The John I. Leonard Union doubled in size and both say they've always had a diverse group of students. From looking towards the future to traveling back in history, in 1970, the Roosevelt High School closed its doors for the very last time. Now, students who went there say the school was the center of the black community. And although there are no plans to transform it, the hope is to make it an educational hub. Roosevelt High School today is a dilapidated building at the corner of Tamron and 15. 50 years ago, it was the cornerstone of this neighborhood. 
people knew about Roosevelt all over the state. Deborah Range graduated from Roosevelt in 1966. The memories are just so awesome. It was the best school. Every, I mean, we just, we our pride in that school and how the teachers not only trained us, they cared for us, they loved us. We, we were safe. It was a safe place to learn and to grow. Now Range is one of many working to bring some of that love back to this building, a once prestigious high school during segregation. We need a museum because the museum for African Amer Americans is essential to preservation. Range says a museum would help ensure that all the accomplishments in both athletics and academics would not be stolen by time. I think it is a fantastic idea. And at least since I've been on the school board since 2000, the community has consistently said that they wanted to have something that they could be proud of on that campus. Palm Beach County School Board member Dr. Deborah Robinson says the board has already allocated $10 million from the 2016 penny sales tax referendum, creating an architecture, engineering and technology program in the school, as well as renovate the gym as a multicultural, multi-purpose facility. But that funding does not include dollars for a museum, which would mean raising additional money projected well into the millions. Nevertheless, an endeavor Dr. Robinson says is worthwhile. One of the things that we need to teach everyone is that people of the African diaspora are great people. <laughs> we have accomplished much throughout the centuries and ac across all time and space, including here in West Palm Beach. A number of local historical and alumni groups like the Roosevelt Alumni Association have already started working on reimagining this building for the next generation. Preservation of history, it's our connections to know where we come from, what did we do, what were our accomplishments and achievements, and all of that will be stored in the uh, museum. We need to look at some of the things that we have and some of the deficiencies that we have in our systems. The fight to teach race and ethnicity in local schools, plus the stress of being pulled over by a police officer, the new program showing teenagers how to handle the pressure. The State Board of Education voted unanimously to ban critical race theory. It supports the belief racism is infused in American society and the legal system. What this rule does is continue with making sure that when we teach these standards, they're done um, with professionalism, dutifully and faithfully and properly aligned. The legacies of slavery, segregation and Jim Crow still create an uneven playing field for black people. I say to you, this is not just a theory. It is the plain and simple truth, and I believe that students should be told the truth. The ban means all topics must be factual and objective while being taught during history curriculums and K-12 schools. Although critical race theory was banned, there's a fight now for a new curriculum in Palm Beach County. The school district has a team making sure race relations are one of the top priorities in school. I talked to a Palm Beach County educator with a passion to get our nation's history taught. There are nine elective courses on diversity offered from middle school to high school in the Palm Beach County School District. There's several courses and there's disparate information within those courses, um, but we want to have something that kind of intersects all of those. Brian Knowles is one of the minds behind uh, yeah, fine tuning yeah, all of the courses. But Knowles, who oversees African, African American, Latino, Holocaust and gender studies at the district, wanted more. So he and his colleagues proposed another course. The course itself is going to explore the, the roots of racism, discrimination um, in this country and a lot of different forms of it. The course, Prejudice and Power, a discourse on race and ethnicity in the United States, was denied by the Florida Department of Education. But Knowles says it's not over. Though the class was created before the unrest in 2020, Knowles argues it's even more important now. We understand that there are certain parents and certain you know, community members that may not want their children engaging in those conversations. So we understand and we respect and value um, the opinions and perspectives um, of, of our parents, our, our parents, stakeholders and, and education. 
and it was going to be an elective course. We reached out to the Department of Education to find out why the course was rejected. The DOE said in part, it was determined that there was no need for the course at the statewide level. The purpose of it was not that we're going to look at some of the ugly things that existed in this country, but and stay in that space. But what we wanted to do is look at some of the roots of some of the ugliness that exists in our society. Um, and be able to look at those roots and have our kids explore that. But we need to look at some of the things that we have and some of the deficiencies that we have in our systems and some of the deficiencies that we have in our society and allow our students to kind of look at those things. Knowles plans to rename the course, rework it, and resubmit it. His fight is not over. I just stepped out on faith and did it. The struggles and triumphs for local Black-owned businesses, plus recruiting a diverse workforce, the changes at a Treasure Coast Police Department. You're watching Project Community, Equality and Change. The pandemic shutdown wiped out hundreds of thousands of small businesses in America. And studies show black owned businesses failed at more than twice the rate of white owned companies. And Tom McDermott looks at the challenges they face not only to survive, but to get the federal help that bypassed them at a crucial time. This is our buffalo wings. Um, we fry them how you like them. Okay. This is it, the wings, finger licking wings. Lucky for Tessa Adams, people really like them, and much more, at her two Fats Chicken Shack restaurants on the Treasure Coast. But that doesn't mean the business she and her husband Roscoe started in 2014 didn't struggle last year, especially when they opened this, their second location in Rivero Beach, during the peak of the pandemic. Stepping out on faith, I took the jump. You know, my husband was kind of a little jittery, but I just took, stepped out on faith and did it. But as black small business owners, the Adams defied the odds a year ago. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York estimated that 41% of black owned businesses shut down between February and April in 2020. Too many never came back. I got all these people on payroll and I'm trying to figure out, can I keep everybody? What we saw from February, March and April, it was the greatest and most drastic decline of businesses closing their doors than we saw in any one, two, three, six or 12 month time frame that we know in American history. Amber Batchelor is director of the We Venture Women's Business Center in Sebastian, Florida. The nonprofit provides low and no cost business and technical support to people like Tessa Adams to start and grow their businesses to keep people employed. That 41% of black owned businesses shutting down was inordinately high. A University of California Santa Cruz study found about 32% of Latino owned businesses, 26% of Asian owned businesses, but just 17% of white owned businesses shut down in that February through April 2020 period. Yet somehow Tessa even managed to keep a third restaurant going. She's a very hardworking lady. I admire her. She's almost like a mom to me. She just goes hard and I just follow her lead. This is Sharon, this is our singing waitress. Here you go, baby. Enjoy your greedy burger. Between her two fats chicken locations and the hamburger and custom milkshake place, Greedy Burger, Adams did keep all of her 30 employees on the payroll, even when forced for a time to shift to takeout only. She managed to wade through the Paycheck Protection Program process online, but only got enough of that money for three pay periods. I think that we probably could have had a little more guidance as far as in what's all out there to help, because some banks were not doing anything. And if you weren't banking with a certain bank, they were not taking you in. Even if business owners like Adams were taking in people, giving them jobs in very desperate times. I was in the pandemic, jobless, and Ms. Tessa gave me a chance. She didn't open me from Adam and the man on the moon, and she gave me a chance, and I really love working here. Why did the U.S. government miss a chance to help so many small business people, minority-owned businesses, when this pandemic hit? 
is because unfortunately, many of our minority uh, women entrepreneurs and our black owned businesses, they didn't have those established banking relationships ahead of time. In fact, last year, the federal government required small business owners looking for PPP money to already be in the Small Business Administration's primary loan program. That left out businesses with loans or accounts with smaller community banks. It's fair to wonder whether Tessa Adams believes she and other mom and pop operations were treated fairly. Definitely not, because I know of some big box um, companies, restaurants that got millions of dollars where, you know, the small base businesses, we had a hard time getting thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Even worse, big banks were given a financial incentive to make those relief deals with the biggest companies with higher fees going back to the banks. But in spring 2021, some new hope. President Biden's American Rescue Plan aims a big chunk of change right at small business. $28 billion in grant money for the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. $16 billion for the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program. Live entertainment venues, theaters, performing arts organizations, museums, and more. It all adds up to help for a projected one million of the country's hardest hit small businesses. We see a business boom. We're going to see a black business boom. And I am so excited. This time around, restaurants with more than 20 locations are excluded to make sure larger chains don't scoop up most of the grants. Women and minority-owned eateries get priority access. And though the pandemic isn't over, it looks like the worst days for small business are over. It's picking up now. We, since January, it started picking up, and now that the vaccine is out, it's picking up even more. For Project Community, equality and change. Boy, don't you know I need you so. Mm. I'm Todd McDermott. Please, I gotta know. Love her personality. All right, now we're going to head to Martin County, where community leaders and law enforcement have been working together, examining police techniques and educating people about race relations. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Powerful sounds of protesters filled the streets of Martin County last May. And a year later, these voices continue to have an effect on the community. Jimmy Smith, president of the NAACP in Martin County, helped organize many of these protests. He's a man on a mission. One of the greatest things that I've been mostly focused on, uh, first of all, police uh, treatment. The chief only can uh, do what he can do, but the people work for him. He's working on and making sure that the people that's hired under his leadership uh, be more of uh, 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 transparent, uh, being more fair. And the Martin County Sheriff's Office says they're committed to being more fair. Improving their relations with the community means adding more people of color to their staff. We've done pretty good at diversifying our Sheriff's Office, which for years has really not been that diverse, not because we weren't hiring minorities just because a they weren't putting in and we weren't recruiting them. So we've done we've done both. We've been recruiting hard. In addition to diversifying its workforce, the sheriff's office also reexamined its police techniques. We did away with any kind of neck holds, neck restraints. And while many believe that policy changes are necessary, the mayor of Stewart, Eula Clark, says change begins with education. She's turning the page in her community through books about race. It's been a source of education. More and more people are saying, I'm going to pass this on to my family. I'm going to read more. I'm going to study more. In July of last year, Mayor Clark also created a race relations board, a group that is still tackling racial equality in Stewart. One of the big things that they've come up with and they've agreed with our police department is that neck restraint. That is not something that's going to happen anymore in our Stewart Police Department. And they've also come up with ideas of making sure that each community group starts to have a conversation with each other about how things are going on with regard to race relations in our community. And leaders say this constant communication with the community won't stop. And they're hoping to continue to create more positive change right here in their community. <laughs> Back in April, a 20-year-old black man was killed in Minneapolis during a traffic stop. Officers were trying to arrest Dante Wright on an outstanding warrant. 
The body camera video shows Wright trying to get back into his car. Officer Kim Potter is heard yelling taser, but then fires her gun. The former police officer is now charged in the killing. Back here at home, the Port St. Lucie Police Department is making sure traffic stops are as safe as possible by educating young people. And as Gianna Caserna explains, a new training course will be rolled out to students over the summer on the Treasure Coast. When the siren starts wailing and those blue and red lights flash in your rearview mirror, what you do and say next can have a huge effect on what might follow. We want to educate students about what they can expect during the event that is the single most uh, common reason that police interact with the public. It's a traffic stop. Anyone who's been pulled over by an officer knows the experience can be nerve wracking, maybe even frightening. But Gretchen Raziella says those feelings are totally normal. She's creating the curriculum for Port St. Lucie Police Department's new Steve Brown model traffic stop program that will involve training for both officers and teens on what is expected of them during a traffic stop. We want students to understand what happens on a stop. We want them to understand what they can expect, uh, not only from the officer, but physiologically. You know, being in, in contact with an officer can make police people nervous. So we want them to know it's, it's okay, relax. Uh, we, this is how we manage it. And you can expect that our officers are gonna be professional, they're gonna be courteous, they're gonna be consistent every single time. Officers will be trained to set additional standards for maintaining consistency during a traffic stop. Training for teens will include helping them identify the common reasons teens are stopped by police. What do they want us to know? How can we help them learn? How can we help them positively engage with law enforcement uh, and maybe dispel some uh, misinformation? Uh, but, you know, help our officers at the same time maybe understand that hey listen just because they're a teenager we can't have specific assumptions about how they'll behave or how they won't behave what they know or what they don't know the program will help students and officers have a better understanding of the physiological responses to stressful situations. It'll also debunk a myriad of misinformation about police and include interactive training that will focus on the behavioral basics in a controlled traffic stop simulation. In light of things that have occurred over the last few years, uh, our administration had the foresight to recognize that we, we could make a positive impact during that very first interaction that a teenager has with a law enforcement officer. We could have a positive impact that could carry throughout their lifetime. The program will be unveiled in August at Treasure Coast High School, where the late officer Steve Brown served as the school resource officer. For Project Community Equality and Change, I'm Gianna Caserta. When you look into the word wellness, like search a Google image search, it's not people who look like us. Taking care of the mind and spirit, the virtual healing space created by this local group of inspiring women I just felt like I was underachieving. The Ways, a son is paying tribute to his father by empowering at-risk children. A group of local women has created a virtual way to build a deep spiritual connection with the community, which they believe starts with health, both physically and mentally. Tiffany Kenny has more on their inspiration. Squat down, squeeze up, we're crossing left, one. Jennifer Asayus spends her downtime lifting up others. Next workout, if you're sweating now, you're about to be sweating some more. She is one of the founders of Carnal Moon, a virtual healing space dedicated to mental health and self-care. When they hear Carnal Moon, what does that mean to you? Um, really, it's just the marriage pretty much of the heart and the mind. Carnal Moon was started with the sole purpose of bringing the concept of wellness to the underserved and marginalized communities. Because um, too often when you look into the word wellness, like search a Google image search, 
It's not people who look like us. Jennifer and several other black women started this West Palm Beach based artist collective back in 2018. Why now do you think more than ever this is an important resource for marginalized communities, for people of color? Why is it so important? It's important because we are, in my opinion, experiencing a collective trauma. Um, being in a pandemic, um, experiencing social unrest because of the uprisings and um, inequality due to race, um, because those things need to be addressed. Through thoughtful posts and live workshops on Instagram, Cardinal Moon provides wellness and meditation tips. Issues like racial trauma, microaggressions, and colorism are addressed. We actually create workshops, also offer um, healing information and introduce people to different um, practitioners and professionals that are in different healing spaces. Anwela Alexander is also on this journey with Jennifer. She works as the site's outreach coordinator. A lot of the times we have to be tough and we have to just keep pushing and keep moving. And um, I like to see myself, you know, kind of like an open door cracked open to let people know that, hey, you know, you can come and experience this thing that's going to move your spirit and make you feel like, you know, the things that you've been going through, you're not alone in. You've always heard of the strong Black woman trope. And while we are strong, we are still human. And when you come to Carnal Moon, and that's where the carnal portion comes in, because while we are human, we are also divine and we deserve to be treated as such. The women have created a connected community online. Now they are creating and selling their own products to raise money to find a permanent physical space to call home. This is a space where you can come, bring all of yourself, bring your flawed self, bring your divine self and like allow that to join together um, and just be seen for who you really are. For Project Community Equality and Change, I'm Tiffany Kenny. That gives you all the feels, doesn't I it? I love their attitude. So positive. Very inspirational. Meanwhile, a local man is also building a better tomorrow, building better communities. Shane Wright talked to the Delray Beach man about the nonprofit he started to help teens deal with problems at home and school. Adversity can affect people in a lot of different ways. I was at a low point, wasn't working, had some health issues, and I just I just felt like I was underachieving, man. Seven years ago, it made Emmanuel Dupree Jackson Jr. make a choice. My father had passed, so I knew I had to do something. A choice to make a change in Delray Beach, his hometown, a city where he saw teens trending in the wrong direction. So I kind of just had that mindset that if uh, no one's come to save us, we got to do something about it. Already a school counselor at the time, Dupree created the EJS Project, named after his father, Emmanuel Jackson Sr., a program which builds teens up with mentorship, counseling, and empowering them with everything from educational tools to community service. I talked back a lot, so I would respond back after they said something, so that caused issues, of course. Jemiah Brinson has been in EJS for six years. He has caused me to develop my own thought process and I've become more open-minded and I have built a lot of bridges that can take me uh, far. The priest says since 2013, EJS has helped close to 3,000 teens in the community. They meet on a regular basis for things like learning how to fill out scholarship applications, even learning how to do their taxes in the future, and providing thousands of hours of community service. It's their most important lesson, selflessness. He gives back and like gives to people a lot. He never really asked for anything in return. So I feel like he, he taught me to bless people and, you know, I, I'd rather give than receive stuff. Leading up to Christmas, EJS gave its teens $100 each to shop at Walmart, but not for themselves, for their families. I'm all about equity, and a big part of equity is representation. Kids have to see people that look like them doing something amazing to get them the confidence to feel like I can do that too. There are some people that I went to school with and I'm like, they're they're never gonna get, get it together. It's gonna take something crazy for them to get on the right path. And from that point on, they got better and better and better. There's no telling how many lives EJS has saved, but what's clear is its impact from a young man who just wanted better for his community and who eventually found his purpose. If you could find out what you were put here for, it makes it a lot less stressful living, man. And I tell you, 
uh, that's always a reminder. When those kids tell me, come back and tell me how much I mean to them and how much this program helped them. For me, I, I like to use the word legacy, Shane. Like, I know even if I'm gone, the seeds I planted will still live on. For Project Community, Equality and Change, I'm Shane Wright. Strawberry banana pudding. And the cookies and cream with no banana. The sweet twist on this savvy businesswoman's marketing tech. More and more women are getting down to business. They've been busy creating startup companies during the pandemic. Tiffany Kinney introduces us to a woman determined to make her tasty business more successful than ever. Hi you guys, it's Sasha from Tasty's Pastries. Just want to let you know I have free pudding available today. I have all your favorite flavors available. If you've been to a local farmer's market, chances are you've met Tasha Jafraud. Strawberry banana pudding. And the cookies and cream with no banana. Or as her t-shirt reads, just call her pudding. It's an eye catcher. Everybody, you know, they're like, hey, put it. And then that's how I just start talking to people. I just wear this shirt randomly, you know, to the grocery store and I, I bring flyers with me so I can, it, I'm a walking billboard. A billboard for her burgeoning business, Tasty's Pastries, which is all about pudding. This is a classic banana pudding made with fresh sliced strawberries and Nella wafers. I have the coconut banana pudding made with coconut milk and fresh twisted coconut for a nice little texture. That's the one I tried. That is so good. Oh, it's, <laughs> I love that one. The shredded coconut. I'm a Caribbean girl. I love coconut. While growing up in Palm Beach County, Tasha's parents owned a restaurant. Her dad, the chef. She always wanted to follow in their footsteps. The pudding idea came from um, culinary class in high school. That was the first dessert that I learned how to make and it was like a no-bake dessert, and I thought it was the best thing ever. And being um, a patient descent, I did not know anything about like Southern banana pudding at all. So I fell in love with it the moment I tried it, and I was like, I got something here. So <laughs> I, I, I was like, you know what? I think I can, I can make this a little better. Tasha started Tasties in 2019. A year later, the pandemic hit. I just took that time to plan properly to do my research, to learn, to focus on the things that I'm not the greatest at, because I love baking and, and that is definitely my passion, but numbers um, aren't. <laughs> I'm not really a mathematician at all. So um, I took this time to learn more accounting skills and, and really try to understand my books a lot more. What she has mastered is the art of social media. Tasha uses technology to help spread the word. Supporting is a big deal to me. You know, one like, one share, one follow on social media does wonders. That's how I've gotten a lot of traction is through social media. Uh, like I said, my major is marketing. So, you know, I understand the impact that word of mouth does. So just the like or share would is amazing. Obviously purchasing is even better. <laughs> and obviously if you're wondering if it's tasty, of course it's tasty, we're almost sold out. While building her business, Tasha still works a full-time job. She relies on a supportive family who always pitches in to help. I have 10 nieces and nephews and 11th on the way. So I know that whatever I do is, is, is going to set them up for the future. I want this to be a family run business. I want this to be franchised out. So I know that whatever I do is going to leave a legacy for my, for my family. Hi you guys, it's Sasha from Tasty's Pastries. I just want to let you guys know I am sold out. For Project Community, Equality and Change. They are all gone. I'm Tiffany Kenny. Looks good, doesn't it? Love it. Delicious. Good for her. Well, Tasha's goal right now is to find a food truck, which will allow her to get to more places in the county. Eventually, she wants to own her own storefront. That'd be a great star yeah. for her. So in the meantime, you can find her at the Rust Market in Lake Park every month. She's also going to be at the Riviera Beach Marina every weekend. People right here in our community from all walks of life are working to fight racism. Whether it's picking up a book on black history or joining in on a talk about race. The hope is that we can understand each other, listen to each other, and find common ground. Thank you for watching Project Community, Equality, and Change.